Okay, this video is going to review pathogens. In the chapter in your book, it's going to talk about what makes something alive. And you're going to go, it's going to talk about cells, and you're going to do that in lab also. But what we're talking about now are pathogens, are disease-causing organisms. One type of cell that causes diseases, but in many cases is not, is bacteria. Uh, bacteria, here comes a picture of it for you, one of them. All right, they're prokaryotic, which you're going to look up in your book, and you also see that in lab. You'll talk about it there. They're very, very small. You can't see them uh, with the naked eye. Uh, they're all around you. They're everywhere. I mean, they're everywhere on Earth. They're just everywhere. Um, most of them, the majority, do not cause you to get sick. So we have this image that bacteria are bad, when in most cases they are good for you. And yes, there are some that will cause you diseases, but there are many that will not. So they reproduce very quickly. They go through mitosis, which you'll talk about at some point. When it says some bacteria here, it should say most. Most bacteria are good for you or at least will not hurt you. You have 10 times more bacteria in your large intestine than you have human cells in your whole body. All right. Now others will make you sick, um, especially if it's off balance, if there's a lot more bad than good. And antibiotics. Antibiotics are one of the greatest discovers, discoveries ever. Um, in terms of being able to control a bad bacterial infection, they will hinder the growth and, and or destroy the bacteria. Um, we are overusing them, which we'll talk about a little bit, and you're going to talk about, uh, we'll talk a little bit about antibiotic resistance. So what happens, because bacteria can go through mitosis so quickly, they can also mutate. And so what happens is, let's say you have an infection and it's caused by a certain type of bacteria and you take an antibiotic for it and it works. Ten years down the road, ten years down the road, what can happen is that bacteria has mutated to the point that that antibiotic does not work on it anymore. What I mean by work on it is it doesn't destroy it. So the antibiotic is useless. That bacteria has become resistant to that antibiotic. Here don't worry about reading this in detail this just talks about the how many bacteria you have in your large intestine compared to human cells and again the majority of them are good for you and the ones that may be bad for you if they're outnumbered by the good ones they can't reproduce and so they don't make you sick where we get in problems one of the ways we get in problems is when you're taking something and you're destroying the good bacteria and what happens is you leave all this open space that now the bad bacteria can go through mitosis and can reproduce and make you sick so one of the side effects of taking antibiotic is not only do you destroy the bad ones but you're also destroying the good ones and that can cause problems like diarrhea and nausea and things like that okay so bacteria basically this is saying these are good for you um, you're supposed to have them they're now showing that your ability to gain or lose weight may be connected to what's called your microbiome and a microbiome you'll watch a video on this is basically the a picture of all the types of bacteria that exist in your intestines or exist in your sinuses that exist anywhere um, the appendix we used to think of as a uh, vestigial organ that didn't do anything what they're showing now is that it actually may contribute to supplying your intestines with bacteria so there may be a positive benefit to having your appendix now the hygiene hypothesis I want to talk about this briefly we have this tendency and if there's one thing a couple things you get out of this class is is this we have this tendency to use antibacterial everything um, you know soap shampoo whatever pretty soon they have antibacterial toilet paper but what happens is we're cleaning up not just the bad bacteria but the good bacteria and so imagine a large table that you're going to clean and on that table are millions and billions of bacteria and maybe there's one or two bad ones on that table but they can't reproduce because there's no space for them so what happens is you go over it with an antibacterial soap but you miss some spots and what you did by accident not even knowing it is you killed a lot of the good bacteria but you didn't kill the bad and so now what happens is that bad bacteria has a lot of space to reproduce and go through mitosis
and now that bad bacteria takes over. So if I can recommend anything to you, it's do not use antibacterial stuff. Now this hygiene hypothesis, the more research that is done, the more they're finding it to be true. That we have this tendency to raise children in very clean, too clean environments. So you buy antibacterial this, you buy antibacterial that, you don't let your child you know, go on the floor, you don't let them play in the dirt. They are born with not a very strong immune system. But that immune system is maturing as they age. And so what they're thinking is, and the research is backing this up, is that if they're not exposed to anything bad, their immune system doesn't know how to respond. And then as they get older, if they're suddenly exposed to something like cats or to peanuts or something like that, their immune system hyper responds to it. And that's really what an allergy is. It's a hyper response of the immune system. So studies that support, th support this have shown that children that are raised in households with cats and dogs are less likely to get asthma or allergies. And asthma is kind of an allergic inflammatory response. Kids that play in the dirt more are in a dirtier environment actually have stronger immune systems. So the hygiene hypothesis is saying that do not raise your child in such a clean environment. Raise them in an environment where they're exposed to different different bacteria and different things in the environment so their immune system learns how to react properly to them. And again, it's not it's a hypothesis, but more and more research is showing it to be true. This is just, again, you don't need the details here, but salmonella, it can show you that this is a bad bacteria that can make you very, very sick. Um, again, in large amounts, it will do it. Some E. coli are good for you. Others, like below, are bad for you. So again, there's different uh, species of different types of uh, bacteria. Some are good and some will make you sick. Okay. Viruses, viruses are different in that they're smaller than bacteria. Technically, we don't really call them alive. Um, they actually need, they need to live in another cell in order to survive. They're basically DNA and protein. So what happens is they don't have the cell parts that you're learning about in the chapter. They don't have those cell parts, so they can't reproduce on their own. So basically what they do, to show you here, these little proteins sticking out, these are three different viruses. What they actually do is they kind of trick a cell. They knock on the, the cell membrane of the cell, like knock, knock, and the cell says who's there, and the virus says, oh, it's the Avon lady. And since the cell just happens to need lipstick, it lets the virus in. And so the virus has tricked its way into the cell. And then what the virus is going to do, it's going to insert its DNA into the cell's DNA, and then that DNA of the virus is now in the cell DNA, it's now going to use the cell parts with that DNA in order to make more and more copies of the virus. Until, until there's so many viruses in that cell that the cell explodes, kind of breaks apart, and the viruses then go off and try to trick other cells into letting them in and reproducing. So they take over a cell, just like I said. So they're not considered considered living by the definition of alive, but obviously they can make us sick. The flu, the cold are all, all caused by viruses. Um, the flu, there's several versions of the flu. There's several different versions of the virus that causes the cold. Antibiotics do, do not work on viral infections. So if you have a cold or the flu, unless you're really, really sick, sometimes they will give you an antibiotic to make sure um, because you're, if your immune system is suppressed and not working very well, they don't want you to get a bacterial infection on top of it. But for a common cold or the common flu, you don't want to take an antibiotic. Um, if you're, you're just, it's not going to help you at all. Um, some doctors, if you beg them enough, will give you uh, antibiotic, but that actually is going to contribute to antibiotic resistance increasing over time. All right, HIV, we'll talk just briefly about it. HIV is actually a virus that specifically attacks cells of your immune system, specifically helper T cells, which you don't need to know the specifics of that. But what they do is they trick their way into the immune system cells. They take over that cell. When that cell explodes with the virus, then the cell is gone. And so what happens is, since this virus attacks your immune system cells, the more active the virus is, um, your immune system is suppressed and you're more likely to get other diseases. And those other diseases are what causes a person to die of HIV. Um, this is just a little far side there. Um, 
you're from France. Wow, save lovely eyes. Hey, everyone, we're going to Paris. So what that means is uh, he may pass on the infection, okay, to another person. And one of the things that can happen much easier now with bacterial or viral infections is it can travel around the world relatively quickly. Um, if you think about how many people travel cro across the ocean um, on a daily basis now, if a disease starts in China, it will not take long um, to get to the United States or vice versa. This just shows you the most dangerous type of flu viruses are those that um, may infect birds but then mutate enough that they can infect a person. And since the person, people are not, have not been exposed to this type of virus, the death rate can be much higher. Same thing, when a, when a virus from a pig mutates enough that it can now infect humans, that those are the most deadly types of viruses. Um, if our body has never been exposed to a virus like that, uh, it's more, much more likely to have a higher death rate. Okay, parasites. Parasites are large multicellular organisms. Uh, the most common one you'll hear about with water is Giardia. Giardia, here's coming at you. Giardia is multicellular. If you put it under a microscope, you could see it swimming around. Um, it comes from animal feces. And so when you look at that nice, you know, nice water in the spring in the creek as you're walking along and it looks all clean. Um, what you have to think about is that maybe upstream there's a raccoon or a squirrel pooping, okay, into that water. And most people will not die of Giardia, but you will feel so sick that you might wish you were dead while you had it. Um, it can cause severe diarrhea and you can die from that from dehydration. I have this elephant picture here because uh, several years ago I went to South Africa and we took this little Makoro, which is like a canoe, and we, the, we had our Makoro driver, he had a big stick, and he was taking us out to see the hippos. And as we were going, um, he was drinking water straight out of the, the river we were in, which I just couldn't imagine doing. And not only that, some uh, elephant poop had floated by. And like right after it floated by, he grabbed some water and drank it. And then he's like, would you like some? And I'm like, no, that's fine. Um, systems, people's systems are used to different things. His system could have that and probably be OK. Um, my system could not. And our system could not. We're just not used to those kind of things in our water. OK, this is just a little fact here. Don't worry about that. All right, next one is fungus. Uh, fungus, a mushroom walks into a bar and asks for a drink. And the bartender says, we don't serve mushrooms. And the mushroom says, but why? I'm such a fun guy. But I'm bum chink. That's your stupid joke of the day. All right. Fungi are eukaryotic cells like other animal cells. They're difficult to treat because they are so much like our cells. So if you've come up with something that kills fungal cells, you also have a good chance there's going to be side effects in killing human cells. Fungal infections are not going to kill most people unless their body is immunosuppressed due to HIV or some other reason. Okay, athlete's foot is a fungal infection. I'm going to show you kind of a gross picture. So you're ready. Close your eyes if you're not. Okay, so it's a fungal infection. Um, this is a pretty severe case. It's difficult to treat um, because you, if you treat it internally, well, it's difficult to do that, but even if you uh, treat it externally, when you put some of those drugs that are out there on that, it's not like, boom, you put them on for two days and it's gone. Um, it takes a long time to get rid of it. Uh, athlete's foot, you also have to make sure to find the source of it. I had a student whose daughter, um, she told me her daughter would get rid of the athlete's foot and then two weeks later it would come back and they couldn't figure out why. And it turns out that um, she was divorced and her daughter was going to visit her ex-husband or, or the daughter's father and it was in his it was in his shower. So they had to make sure, um, they had to make sure to clean out his shower and that's where she was getting it every time she would go visit him. So we talked about the hygiene hypothesis and not being too clean, but if you're going into strange showers, I would wear flip-flops. Why take a chance with it? Fungal infections under the toes. Um, to treat those orally, internally, you have to be on the drug for a long period of time, and that's because you can't give them too strong of a drug because, again, it can have negative side effects on human cells because they're so similar. Prions, um, these are pretty interesting. They are just proteins. They don't even have DNA. They enter cells of the brain and cause the normal proteins in the brain to convert. And then what happens is these proteins fold funny and then the cells are destroyed. So it will actually cause holes to form 
in the brain and they cause the type of disease called spongiform encephalopathies, which basically means uh, sloppha here is brain here is disease here think of the word sponge okay. you probably have heard of some of these scrapie and sheep and goats are caused by these mad cow disease this means central nervous system so what happens here's a pissed off cow so what happens is these get into the cow's brain and then it causes these uh, holes to form in the brain which obviously is going to change the behavior of the cow to the point that it does not survive in humans, there is a disease called Crutchfeld-Jacobs disease that is similar, caused by caused by the same prions, and this is named after the two doctors that actually came up with uh, what we, they get to name the disease, or the disease was named after them because they put so much effort into figuring out what was causing it. Um, in Australia, with the Aborigines there, they saw a large number of deaths in females and in children and they would act kind of like the cows they would get unbalanced couldn't think straight and boom they would die and what they found was and it took years for them to figure this out is when in the tribes there what was normal was when a person died the children and the women would prepare the body um, and part of that preparation involved actually eating the brain and so what was happening is by eating the brain they were getting these prions and then passing the disease on to mostly women and children. Um, there was some issues with could, if you ate meat um, from a cow that had mad cow disease, could you develop Crutchfeld-Jacobs disease? In the 1980s, it was found, while very rare, that yes, it could be passed from cow to human or from eating meat. Now, when you eat the meat of a cow, you should not be eating their central nervous system. So if treated properly, it should not be an issue. In 2003, in the United States, in, in, in Washington State, a, there was found one cow that had mad cow disease. They destroyed that cow. They destroyed all the herds of cow. Every farm in the area, all the cows were destroyed. And even with that precaution and the fact that they know it didn't get into the meat supply, um, several countries would not take our hamburger or our meat from cows for several years. Okay. All right, we're not going to do this. So that's just the basics of the different types of pathogens. Um, know the basics here. You'll see questions on the test, and it's also going to help you with the. Um, it's also going to help you with the case study that you're going to do. Look at looking at the microbiome and looking at antibiotic resistance and so on. If you have any questions about anything like this, uh, please just let me know.